Hello and welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya and today we look at severe floods in South Africa, protests against the coastal gas link pipeline in Canada and the UK government imposes sanctions on Chelsea FC director Eugene Tenenbaum. We begin with South Africa where at least 400 people have died due to severe flooding after heavy rainfall. The worst hit area has been the KwaZulu-Natal province, which is facing a major humanitarian crisis. Rescue efforts are still on and the death toll could be even higher. Over 40,000 people were affected as per the government. Essential infrastructure has been destroyed and the regional government has called it one of the darkest moments in the history of the province. Meanwhile, more rain is expected over this weekend as well. We spoke to Monica Lagan Parsad, associate editor of New Frame, about the situation and reasons for it. Hi, Monica. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, could you begin by just giving us a sort of idea of uh, the scale of the flood and also whether the area which has uh, affected uh, was it flood prone? Is it flood prone or is this completely unanticipated? Um, hi, good, good day. Thank you so much for having me here. The scale of the devastation is the biggest it's ever been in South Africa, and they're calling it the country's largest or biggest natural disaster ever. Um, at this point, they're still mopping up the costs, uh, which is estimated around 750 million rand. Um, we don't really know how far widespread it is. Um, they're still kind of counting it. We're still kind of looking at different areas because it's it's an entire province. So it's not just one specific region. Um, and the province is it's quite large. It's one of the, the second largest province in the country. So we're looking at around more than, I think, 100 kilometers of damage and even more that goes because it's a coastal city, it's a coastal province. So it'll go from the north to the south. So at this point, it seems to be mostly the metropolitan area, which is the city of Durban, which is the, the big city in the province. It seems to be most of it is concentrated in that specific area, but large sides of the south coast have also been severely damaged. Um, there are 395 people who have died. They're still looking for many more people are missing. Um, they're still recovering several more bodies of people that have been buried under collapsed structures and people that have been buried in mudslides. Um, the scale of the infrastructure, bridges have been destroyed, major artillery roads have been closed. So a lot of people have been cut off. They haven't been able to get out of where they are. Um, so there's a lot of damage there. There's a lot of damage to the coastline, the beaches. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but I mean, it's so bad that petrol tankers have washed up on the beach. Um, tires have washed up, those bodies been washing up. Um, in terms of, it is a flood, some areas are floodplain areas, specifically people um, in shared settlements uh, who haven't, who've built close, obviously people who build close to sources of water because um, it makes logical sense. Um, so those areas have been the hardest hit, obviously, and those people have uh, been largely displaced and mostly um, that's where large, portion of the deaths have happened. Um, in some areas, it was just unexpected, specifically in low-lying areas and areas close to detachment areas. From what I can gather, there was some flooding, flooding predicted. There was a warning, but I don't think anyone expected it to be at this level. Um, I mean, I think there was some reports that were saying that they saw the amount of rain that happened over two days was five months amount of rain. And that's how much of rain came through. So. In some areas, yes, there was flooding expected, but in some areas, it was just oh, entire houses have been collapsed. People, okay. it's just unbelievable, yeah. Could you also give us an idea of how the government, how the authorities have responded to this uh, crisis? So at the moment, they're busy trying to draft up plans. There has been quite a bit of money that has been released from the National Treasury to start dealing with that, and it's been prioritized obviously to people who are most vulnerable. Um, for the moment, people that have been displaced have been put in different shelters in halls and schools and things like that do kind of, and it's probably at this point, there's over 50,000 displaced people, but I suspect there will be more. Um, and at the moment, they're trying to kind of make sure that they get people housed immediately. The most critical thing is access to fresh water, which has been short this, um, supply. Lots of people have been without water and electricity for almost a week now. So I think that's the most critical thing is to make sure that they get people housed, 
give them access to water and food, um, which is also quite a critical thing. So I think those are the most important things that that's what the provincial government is trying to address. But in addition to that, there's a lot of aid agencies that have come forward and also providing very critical care. Um, a lot of um, healthcare facilities, for example, like hospitals are without fresh water. So a lot of fresh water has been organized there. There's so much to do. I, to be honest, I wouldn't, I can't imagine how one would, even begin to start to think, where do you start organizing this? Uh, we read an uh, editorial in New Frame uh, earlier today, which actually puts the entire uh, region in a context. And we were curious, would, would, a, would a devastation of this scale uh, have happened anywhere else in the same way? Uh, how did the location contribute? No, I don't think so. Remember, we've also just come out of the riots last year in July. It was also the same place. KZN suffered um, tremendous. I mean, they have, they've barely recovered from that. So this, in addition to that, is exceptionally devastating. And we've seen that the government or the regional government in, South, in KZN, specifically the ANC, um, has been quite problematic. There's jo jobs that have been given away. There's a lot of corruption, um, a lot of services having been provided to people. And one of the most basic things that people have been going over without for, for more than two decades has been around housing and the, the, the desperate need for people for housing, for proper housing, adequate housing, safe housing. Uh, we've seen people, activists in those areas, um, housing activists being murdered for these things, but the very same government that's supposed to assist them. And those people are the ones that have been most affected. Um, and so this, if that had been dealt with, even during the rioting, it's the same people that have been devastated again and again and again. And there hasn't been any move. They've learned, they've learned nothing from the riots, um, which is quite, you know, it's really sad. Um, I really hope that going forward that this is a crisis that people will see the emergency and will see that these people need urgent help and care. Um, but as you know, when anything like this devastation happens, it's always the poorest people that are the biggest losers in the tragedy. Monica, thank you. Thanks very much for joining us. In Canada, resistance to the coastal gas link oil pipeline project over indigenous lands continues. According to resistance groups, the Royal Mounted Canadian Police have been visiting villages in the Wet'suwet'en tribe lands regularly. Police sometimes arrive even eight times a day and subject people to strict round-the-clock surveillance. There have been arrests and legal harassment of the resistance activists who say the pipeline is a carbon bomb. The resistance has expanded after the COVID-19 pandemic and is demanding the main investors in the pipeline project, including the Royal Bank of Canada, pull out of it. We have Anish from People's Dispatch with more on this. Anish, what are really the main issues surrounding this issue? What are the activists demanding and what is the response to it? So the primary issue here is the fact of uh, sovereign entitlement to indigenous lands by uh, by the indigenous groups. So the First Nations group that we are talking about, Wet'suwet'en, have been fighting a uh, long-standing battle to uh, to get their uh, sovereign rights over the land, which is around 22,000 square kilometers of land we are talking about, uh, to be recognized by the state of Canada and also the state of British Columbia. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is also the others. It's, it's not necessarily a secondary issue, but it is a very important issue that comes after sovereign uh, land entitlement, which is uh, that of climate change. And this is something that indigenous groups, not only in Canada, but across North America, have been highlighting in their struggles against pipeline. We have seen that uh, in different situations across uh, over the past few years. Uh, so this uh, pipeline alone will bring about half a, mil half a billion uh, pounds or worth of uh, carbon monoxide uh, emissions every day if the amount that they are talking about which is uh, uh, of uh, gas will be transferred and burnt every day it, that is what the carbon emissions will amount to and uh, this can actually increase the emissions uh, rate by nearly 12 percent for Canada alone so this is something that is uh, massive 
uh, when it comes to, at a time when we're already talking about a climate crisis in the making, right? We are looking at uh, rebellions, not just by civil society movements, but also scientists across the world trying to highlight this matter. And it is at the, at the front lines of the struggle, we have indigenous groups like the Wet'suwet'en fighting it uh, on the ground, uh, risking arrest, risking lawsuits and legal challenges for years now. So this uh, whole thing on the ground, the fight, the struggle on the ground began uh, four years ago uh, when they started occupying key sites, key drill sites, uh, which includes uh, uh, areas that were close to headwaters of rivers, major rivers that supply drinking water to not only the people residing in those lands, but also are considered to be sacred by the indigenous groups themselves. So uh, issues of polluting the land, issues of uh, you know pol possibly even polluting drinking water is something that the indigenous groups have highlighted for a long time. As I said, at the core of this is the dispute that, uh, it's not necessarily a dispute if you look at the history since 1997 when a major Supreme Court judgment has recognized Aboriginal uh, land rights as an important part of Aboriginal uh, rights uh, in Canada. Uh, the whole claim of sovereignty, considering the fact that there is no treaty, there is no uh, law that actually annexes the land, this remains to be an unceded land territory. And so this needs to, be, uh, this is something that the tribe has been highlighting for years now. And this also comes through when we're talking about how the, as you said, the responses of the state and yes, the government. Yes, I was keen to know what are the tactics really that are being used so right now we are looking at, as, uh, as you pointed out, the surveillance, uh, the round the clock surveillance that has been happening since March at least, or in, in fact, uh, if you argue it, uh, since January when the last uh, sit-in was uh, violently uh, uprooted by the, the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mountain Police. Uh, uh, in that, since then we have had 24-7 uh, surveillance by the police. In fact, uh, even during the sit-in, which went on for nearly two months uh, in between Jan uh, November and January, uh, we have had reports showing that the Canadian, uh, the RCMP actually spent about close to a million dollars uh, just to deal with the, with the protesters. So the amount of investment that the state is putting in to make this uh, pipeline work is enormous. And you don't see that, uh, you know, very uh, often in, say, even normal law enforcement uh, or even the expansion, uh, you know, the uh, outreach of the state in these regions to these in indigenous groups and tribes to begin with. So uh, this is the kind of situation we are looking at. Uh, the state government has also not done much. Even political parties, major political parties, have uh, either shied away from uh, taking a stand or have uh, tried to um, uh, demand concessions from the indigenous groups to allow for the pipeline to happen. Now, okay. the, uh, now it is not just, as I pointed out, it is not just about the pipeline going through an indigenous land, which is, uh, you know, where the sovereignty rights is disputed, but also the fact that they do not want the pipeline to begin with. They do not want Canada to keep going down the path of building more and more gas pipelines, even though the Trudeau government is talking about net zero emissions and, uh, you know, targets in the next few decades. We still do not see any kind of uh, major, uh, you know, policies when it comes to these pipelines or other kinds of fossil fuel projects uh, being taken very keenly. Even, uh, you know, state-funded uh, banks, like the RBC, which is one of the primary uh, financier of this project, uh, has actually shut down debates uh, uh, and proposals to, uh, to prevent more fossil fuel funding, or at least to limit them or regulate them to the point where environmental clearances and indigenous rights are respected. Even simple matters like that are being taken out by the resolutions in the shareholders holders meeting. We have reported about that in our website. So these are uh, the ways uh, where not only the company, the financiers, but also the government have responded to when they were dealt with 
uh, with these group of protesters. We're not talking about thousands of people. We're talking about a small tribe uh, and a small group of protesters. But the ma manner in which they have actually evoked responses nationally shows how important it is for Canada as a whole and also for other countries because the primary ex uh, user of these of this project would be beneficiary of this project would be the United States which will be taking most of the gas so this is part of the larger uh, because it's part of the larger pipeline project but that is what we are looking at it's a, the implications are huge and it is something that also is, is something that we need to consider at a time of uh, when we talk about climate crisis and so on all right. Thank you very much for that information. And finally, we go to the world of football, where Chelsea FC continues to be in the eye of a storm. This is due to sanctions imposed by the British government on current owner, the Russian billionaire Roman Abramovich. The latest news is that the football club's director, Eugene Tenenbaum, is facing sanctions allegedly due to receiving funds from Abramovich, uh, Chelsea play Crystal Palace on Sunday in the second semi-final of the English FA Cup but the more exciting race seems to be who will bag the ownership of the club in what is being billed as the biggest franchise sale in sporting history and we will we spoke to uh, Siddhant Ane earlier about this. Siddhant what's with the biggest asset freeze ever what is the UK government up to here? Probably a question that has very little to do with sport at this point and, and more to do with uh, big capital uh, and what the UK government and its allies across the pond in the United States as well as in mainland Europe uh, in, in terms of NATO uh, are trying to do in the context of the Russia-Ukraine war. So we already know that Chelsea FC uh, owner Roman Abramovich is under sanctions by the British government and it has also come to light recently that Eugene uh, Tenenbaum, who was uh, part of the board, has also been sanctioned now. Uh, the latest news coming in, and uh, I think Sky News is the one to report this exclusively somewhat, uh, confirming that George Osborne, who is the a former chancellor to the Exchequer, uh, which is, I guess, the equivalent of the finance minister in the United Kingdom, uh, has joined the advisory board of uh, the consortium that's leading uh, the sort of takeover effort or the or the bu buying effort of what you uh, rightly said is uh, being billed as the largest franchise sale in sporting history anywhere in the world. And uh, what is equally unsurprising is that the front runners to uh, sort of win the bid are now um, there's a person by the name of Todd. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, uh, uh, Todd Bowley, I think. Uh, an American who is part owner of the uh, the LA Dodgers in the United States. So much like uh, Manchester United and other clubs uh, in England, the likely possibility is that Chelsea also will very soon be run by billions not coming from, so not Russian capital, but American capital will uh, come in and re replace uh, Abramovich's dollars, essentially. That, that is the that latest is, that is, yeah. is that is really about uh, the American money? Uh, well, it, it, that's what it has become about, I guess. Uh, the, the, the response to uh, Russia's military operations in Ukraine from NATO and its allies has been uh, widespread imposition of economic sanctions, as has been pretty much the U.S.'s doctrine over uh, the past few decades. So, uh, yeah, very much so. I mean, it's a continuation of this sanctions regime and uh, in, I mean, it's a longer conversation that I guess will also evolve as, uh, as time goes on. But it's a question of, I, in a sense, expropriating some kind of asset and then uh, maybe reappropriating them uh, and or reallocating them to people who you consider uh, on your side of the argument or on your team. Uh, in a wider sense, I'm sure this will have an impact on uh, how football clubs or sports franchises operate in the wider context of global capital and whether if you invest uh, private money in, in a particular institution, whether it's a club or any other kind of franchise, how safe is that uh, in the future? Because as we know, like with much of Russian capital, 
uh, coming into the United Kingdom, the idea of that happening was that the rule of law in the United Kingdom is pro what protects that money, right? So Russians who lived in Russia and were unsure about how their own government might uh, behave took their money and put it in these places because they thought it was safe and 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 such. And now we find that that it is absolutely not. And in all of this mix, uh, on uh, tomorrow is Easter Sunday. Uh, the English FA Cup is on, and Chelsea are playing a semi-final. So uh, it's all happening as far as Chelsea is concerned at the moment. Uh, but it's a developing story. Uh, like I'm saying, Pragya, uh, this uh, the latest bit about George Osborne's involvement just came in a couple of hours ago. So we'll track it over the weekend and maybe come back with an update uh, sometime next week. And that is all we have today. Do come back to us tomorrow. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and read us on www.peoplesdispatch.org.